Hello and welcome to our show today. Uh, my name is Rebecca Larson. I am a PhD student at the University of Texas at Austin and one of the hosts of Astronomy on Tap here in Austin, Texas. Today we have a really special show for you. It's not our traditional Astronomy on Tap show, uh, which will be next week. So make sure that you tune in next Tuesday and um, we'll have Sorry about that, we've got feedback going on. Um, so make sure that you tune in next week and we're gonna have a special set of engineers coming in today uh, to talk about the Mars Rover that's gonna be launching at the end of the month. And we're gonna have uh, some questions from the audience and we're also gonna have some answers uh, to some pre-established pre, uh, questions that we have. So if we could call in Jason Achilles who is going to give us an intro to the show uh, we have moderators in our chat who will be posting links for us. So go ahead and uh, take it away, Jason. All right, everybody, uh, can everybody hear me okay? Cheers, everyone. This is Astronomy on Tap. And uh, so please feel free to join us for a beverage here. And uh, this is a uh, fine IPA from Firestone Brew. Oh, all right. so. Yeah, I'm uh, incredibly excited and I want to thank in advance, just thank everybody who's given their time to be a part of this. Uh, we have a, a, a set of brilliant engineers, scientists, and um, and as I, we said in the promotion for this, the, the, the shipbuilders uh, who are creating this amazing piece of machinery that's going to fly to another world. Um, we, uh, we're living in a, an incredibly exciting time right now for those who love space and space travel. Uh, 50 years ago, the world's you know, collective consciousness was awakened and their imaginations were stirred by like the, the sort of the first great space race, uh, you know, between primarily between uh, Russia and America. And uh, both these nations accomplished incredible things during this time. Uh, and we, uh, you know, had had incredible budgets to match uh, the support of their of their nations, the, these space programs. Um, and then, uh, sort of, the race kind of came to an end, uh, and there was a bit of a lull in at least uh, human exploration, uh, or or the, the you know sending people out into space farther and farther. We uh, we created space stations that have been in orbit, uh, including the International Space Station, which has been continuously had human uh, humans on it for, I don't know how many years now. It's, it's, we've had people above us, flying above us every day and night uh, for quite a long time. And, uh, but it's only been recently, I'd say in the last maybe five years or so that, 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 that the idea of mankind setting foot on other worlds has really become not science fiction anymore. I mean, this is something that we're all gonna see in our lifetimes and it's incredibly exciting and it's reinvigorated everybody's excitement of space, which is amazing. You see a lot more people wearing NASA t-shirts and, and, uh, and uh, so uh, with that, uh, we have this beautiful robotic explorer Perseverance, which is paving the way for this future human colonization and for us to learn about these other worlds. And uh, so Perseverance is set to embark uh, to Mars and it's gonna fly very soon, which is why we, um, we're so grateful for the time these uh, scientists have put in today because I wanted, I wanted to schedule this when it was on the eve of the launch of this uh, rocket, but also these people are still working to get this thing ready to fly. Um, so uh, we really are grateful for their time and uh, I guess we're going to start with our first guest, which is uh, Jim, Professor Jim Bell. And uh, Jim, if you want to unmute. Hey. All right. Hey, hey. Cheers, Jason. Cheers, Going Jim. with the red wine tonight. It's five o'clock oh. somewhere. Yeah. So uh, Jim, Jim, and I have, Jim and I have become drinking buddies, actually. That's kind of. <laughs> we, um, because, of this, because of this series, right? We, we technically did meet in a bar. Uh, we met at an Astronomy on Tap lecture um, in person um, for the first time. You were speaking, I think, that day, right? And, yes, uh, sir. 
So I had reached out to Jim. Uh, Jim, in, in addition to, all right, I'm going to read very quickly. Principal investigator of Mast Cam Z, which is the primary camera on the Perseverance rover. Jim is the guy, he's the boss. He's the guy who runs that whole mission and the design of it. So if you have any questions about cameras, Jim is the guy to ask. Um, and uh, he also is the president of an organization called the Planetary Society, which I was a member of. It was started by Carl Sagan back in, I think, 81. Is that right? 1980. 81. 1980. Yeah. Uh, 1980. And I was a member of the Planetary Society when I was a kid, when I was, I think, I don't know, very young. Um, my parents signed me up. And so after I started working uh, for the Jet Propulsion Laboratory a few years ago as a, as a consultant, I, I reached out to Jim because I thought nothing could be cooler than speaking to the folks that are part of this organization. And then Jim and I became friends. Yeah. And what I wanted to just tell people is if you're interested, if you dream of a career in space, it's very important to have a mentor, somebody that you can look up to who's been doing this forever, who knows the ropes, who knows what not to do as much as what to do. And Jim has been a mentor for me. And uh, oh, through man, your you, guidance, you get me yeah, over you, this, this guy, <laughs> uh, it was, it was Jim that encouraged me to make my first presentation at a scientific conference, a science, a planetary conference in Berlin. Awesome. So awesome. I traveled across the world to give this paper. And this is all because this man that I'm introducing right now encouraged me to do it. And he's been an amazing voice. Uh, and so Jim, why don't you just give yourself a little introduction and explain well, to folks and, your job here. Jason, you're, you're a great example of, you know, space has been your bread and butter and, and yet you can, you're making some amazing contributions. I hope we get to talk about microphones. Uh, when we talk about the rover tonight, so I want to I want to hear an update from you. But yeah, so I'm I'm uh, just a you know space nerd, like probably like 90% of the people who are watching right now, maybe 120%. Um, and I uh, uh, grew up using a telescope and looking at the night sky, and had a had some great mentors and teachers who encouraged you know studying astronomy and, and space exploration. And when I was a kid, they were driving cars on the moon. Right, it was crazy. And, uh, and so I just knew I wanted to be part of that. And I've, I've been incredibly fortunate to be involved um, through my career in, um, in the Mars Rover's uh, Sojourner that went in 97, Spirit and Opportunity in 2004, Curiosity in 2012, and now uh, Perseverance, which is over my shoulder here in my garage. Not really, it's packed up in the rocket. Uh, this is just a, a picture. Uh, but, uh, you know, lucky, luckily to not, enough to lead this team of people, scientists, engineers, managers, administrators, students who are uh, building the main science cameras for the rover. So pretty going to say your other car is a lunar rover, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. No uh, Jim, why don't you, could you tell us real quick how you actually started in, because you've had an incredibly insanely long career, you know, and everybody, I think, I think folks would be really interested to know how everybody yeah. you know, got into that. Like, did you, Yeah, yeah. you've obviously yeah. been doing this a long time. So sure. And, and I started, it started with that childhood interest, you know, and in, in getting support from my parents and teachers and family and friends to use a telescope and learn about the night sky. And I, I actually started out uh, like, like Rebecca, uh, an astronomer. And uh, when I was going through um, undergraduate and, and then um, uh, graduate school, there were very few of these amazing space missions happening. This was in the eighties. And, uh, and so I was using telescopes. I went to the University of Hawaii, used the telescopes on Mauna Kea. I was looking at the moon and Mars. You know, so the astronomers, the real astronomers like Rebecca are like, oh, we don't want to use the full moon telescope. That's terrible. It's like, I want the full moon I'm looking <laughs> at the moon yep. or Mars or something else, you know, really bright. Uh, but I needed big telescopes to do spectroscopy, which is spreading the light out into many, many different colors and, and determining composition and mineralogy. So I was, I was trained as a geologist, using the tools as, as of an astronomer. And, um, and then after I graduated, the, the world changed around me. It, NASA started doing these better, faster, cheaper missions that you've heard about. So many missions came along, such a, an enormous amount of public support and congressional support for, for NASA leading space exploration with, with robotics. And, uh, and, and I had a, a set of skills that, uh, you know, frankly, not a lot of people had because it was so thin in the eighties and uh, using cameras and other instruments and uh, mentors brought me in to uh, some of these missions. And, and your comment about a certain, 
your, your comment about a certain set of skills reminds me of that speech from the movie Taken with Liam Neeson. I have a certain set of skills. <laughs> Exactly. Um, and, and, you know, people with all kinds, it takes all kinds of skills to do this kind of stuff, Jason. I mean, the, this, this rover and the other ones that have been thousands and thousands of people it takes to build them, uh, test them, launch them, operate them. And those people are, you know, there's, you, you mentioned scientists and engineers, but they're, they're technicians, they're students, they're uh, administration and management people. They're, you know, up and down the supply chain you know, and, and just uh, huge numbers of, of, of technical skills needed to do this kind of work. Software, I mean, just, you know, you name it. Well, folks, you, you can see why I think this man is amazing. Um, <laughs> Jim, you're awesome. All right, so uh, why don't you um, mute your video and audio for now, and then uh, okay. we're gonna come back around, we'll have some questions. Sounds Thank good. you. Uh, all right, so Justin Foley is gonna be next. Justin, are you able to uh, click on and join us? I'm here. All right. So, uh, Justin, I'll uh, I'll try and give a a, a, a quicker inter introduction here. But Justin and I also met in the exact same bar, um, and I think you were at a. I, was I giving a talk or was I playing the day that you we met? You played and then gave a talk. Okay, so I played a rock show and then gave a science talk and then you came up, and I was. And you were very friendly. I'm like, oh, this guy, okay, cool, we're chatting. And I quickly, very quickly realized this guy knows a thousand times more than I do about all this stuff. And uh, so I immediately was like, I need to be his friend. Uh, so Justin, why don't you start, before you tell us about your job, why don't you tell us, why don't you show everybody where you're at? Because you're in a very special place to be uh, uh, broadcasting to us today. Yeah, so I'm actually, um, I'm sitting in the, the, the building that uh, at JPL where we have our test bed, uh, which is where we test the, um, the non-flight um, systems that represent the rover. So I've actually got, let me see if I can do this. I was going to say, can you, can you give us a spin there? Are you allowed to do that? I've actually Whoa. got a view. <laughs> here, um, leave, it, leave it to the engineers to set up the remote cameras. Uh, well, no, actually, this is sitting right next to me. I, it was easier for me to... <laughs> It's easier for me to do it this way than to uh, try to sit in front of it because it's at a weird angle. But um, that I, I'm sitting here where we do testing on hardware that is representative of what flies, um, so that we can do you know various types of like software and and um, and system level tests, like how everything talks to each other. Um, so what you're looking at here is um, the rover that stays on Earth that represents the Curiosity rover that's on Mars right now. We're we're currently in the process of building one of these for Mars 2020. Um, it's just not ready yet. So I'm showing you one that's very similar. And I figured I could maybe point at it or something if, if, the, if any questions uh, warranted it. No, this is, this is a normal, normally people have a PowerPoint backdrop. You have like real life backdrop. So that's- There's a, there's a real rover, yeah, right there. <laughs> Can you just really quickly while you're um, explain to people what like the sort of, the, about how the room works, the clean room, just the basic principles of that for folks that you know, about keeping things with the bacteria and, you know, keeping things. Yeah, so we, we use clean rooms. For, Why is it uh, called clean room, I guess? Yeah. <laughs> um, the room that's that's next to me here that I was just showing is not, is we actually call that the dirty side because it's got a big gravel pit in it and it gets very dusty. Um, but the very important, um, like that rover, there's very important hardware inside of it, very sensitive hardware. And um, the, the test bed that I, I normally work in has all that hardware, but kind of exposed, so you can get to all the connectors and things on it. Um, and so we the keep place that, that I visited you at on um, yeah on the other side of campus there. Right? Yeah, 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 and it's it's uh, it's a very you know like light colored room similar to the, the one. It, it looks like just for so folks, I'll give people a little context. It kind of reminds you of uh, Back to the Future when you go into Doc Brown's where, w workshop and there's just hoses and wires sticking out everywhere. Like, don't touch this because it'll fry you. But it's, yeah, yeah, probably about a 100,000 miles of wire in there. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we yeah, use that kidding, are you? <laughs> hardware is so sensitive. Um, we want to make sure that there's you know not dirt and um, and things getting into the connectors, and uh, we have to be very careful with um, like if you're walking around, you touch a doorknob, and it's and you see that spark. We don't want that to happen when we're touching the hardware. So we have to be very careful. Everything is built around keeping it very safe. That's the reason we use that. Um. Perfect. Uh, all right, just so Justin, we'll we uh, we'll be back with you as well. And um, thank you. And I like the beard. This is you're looking uh, <laughs> quarantine beard. <laughs> well, it's a little too well coiffed for like coronavirus beard. You know, normally it gets a little more 
I, I, I trimmed it for this occasion. Yeah, it was like that. <laughs> All right, so Justin, why don't you uh, mute your audio and video now? We're gonna move to Becca and uh, we'll be back to speak to you more. And uh, Becca, do we have Becca online? You do, hello Jason. Hey. All right, so this is Becca's, is it Siegfried? Is that how you pronounce it? Yeah, okay. like Siegfried and Roy. Siegfried. Uh, so Becca is a new friend of mine. Um, we actually just met in person for the first time today, but uh, she, I was asking Justin, who we just spoke to, if there was anybody else he could recommend that would be a really great person to talk to our audience, especially young people, um, about our rover. And Becca has a, a really cool background that she, and I was hoping you could tell people about this a bit, she, uh, or you, um, were involved in the naming of the rover with kids. And maybe you could just tell us a little bit, was that kids all around the world? Or was that more like, like what, what was the process of that? What was your involvement in that? Yeah, so um, we did a contest to name the rover and a ton of kids all around the world sent in essays. And NASA just asked me really to help make a video to promote the Name the Rover contest. Um, and so that's, so I, I did the first video to promote it, but the exciting thing was, and Justin knows this, um, the thing that was really hard is I actually got to learn what the Rover's name was before the rest of the <laughs> You're like, oh, I want to tell. I had to make a second video to announce the name of the rover. Um, so they didn't tell me like when they, yeah, they didn't tell me until I actually was filming the rover and then they told me there. So it was really hard for me to keep perseverance a secret. Um, but I was able to keep it a secret. And then the rest of the team found out about a week later. So I didn't have to keep it for very long, but. It, was anybody mad at you for not like slipping them the information a little early? Um, no, but I got a lot of bribes. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's awesome. There are people wanting to win some bets or something. Um, could you, um, could you tell everybody just very, maybe very quickly how you, uh, ended up working at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and obviously a little bit more about what you do because that that your involvement with that uh, with the naming was, was totally different from your actual job. Yeah. Um, yeah. Why don't you tell, tell everybody a bit about how you how you felt, you know, fell into this, how you very actively fell into this. And uh, yeah, please. Yeah. So I grew up in a small town in Texas called Fredericksburg. Um, so Rebecca, I don't know if you know where Fredericksburg is, but um texas wine country it is wine country and growing up there you know it's a town of nine thousand, so it was pretty it was a small town a yeah, big um, town yeah <laughs> how yeah. many stoplights did you have yeah we have about 10 and they all start flashing at about 11 p.m at night so you have right. to uh, yeah use it's them more, more of a guideline than a rule at that point yeah yeah that's right um it's one of those towns um but I went to the University of Texas at Austin for my undergrad. So I'll get there in a second. Oh, and I'll yes. Yeah, hook them. Um, in fact, I don't know if you can see my diploma back there, but anyway. Um, so I grew up in a small town in Texas called Fredericksburg. And the night sky was just incredible. Um, so we used to lay out on my front lawn and look up at the stars. And so from a young age, I was interested in space. I think like a lot of kids, um, space is really cool, but being a girl and especially in a, in a small town, um, it was kind of unheard of to think about a career in space, not only space, but even a career in engineering. Um, and then when I got into high school, there was this special class, a teacher decided his name is Brett Williams. He decided to start a class really to teach physics, but use the Newton's laws and building rockets to teach kids about physics. The class was called principles of technology and there was only a few kids in it every year and they were all dudes. Um, but when I was young or when I got into high school, I decided to take this class. So I was the only girl in the class or one of very few, I think I might've been the only girl for a while um, and fell in love with engineering. I loved putting things together, designing things, testing them, 
they broke a lot of the time going back to the drawing board, fixing them and like yeah, break, breaking them's half the fun, right? Yeah, exactly. And our teacher was really good about not giving us any answers. He wanted us to fail so we could learn from our mistakes. So I wasn't very, I wouldn't say I was naturally smart in high school. Um, I didn't make like the best grades, but that class really got me interested in math and science. And I started to see the importance of how math and science applies to the world. So my grades started to improve. Um, and then I didn't think I could ever get into the aerospace engineering program at UT, but my grades started slowly improved and I applied to the aerospace engineering department at UT. And to my surprise, I got in, but then I was like, can I do this? Am I smart enough to be an aerospace engineer? Um, but with a lot of mentorship, like you, that's a theme I think we all keep talking about, um, a lot of mentorship and guidance in college, I ended up doing really well and graduating with honors um, and had internships at SpaceX and JPL and Johnson Space Center when I was in college. So it was just, I just needed a spark, I think, to really like ignite me. But when I was in, I should say, I forgot something really important. When I was in eighth grade, the reason that got me to take this rocket class in high school was because I saw Spirit and Opportunity land. I think Jim Bell knows the story. I think I've told him at one point, but I saw Spirit and Opportunity both land um, on the surface of Mars when I was in eighth grade. And I thought that was the coolest thing ever. And especially, so finding life on other planets became one of my passions. And that's kind of what sparked me to go down to, and take this rocket class in high school. And I never thought I would have the opportunity to work on these rovers because they were only supposed to last 90 days. So I was in eighth grade when they landed. And then by the time I graduated college and applied at JPL and got a job there, they were opportunity was still roving the planet. It's, and it's so incredible, that, was, right? <laughs> yeah, that was my first job, which was my dream job, uh, was to work on opportunity to help all these awesome scientists find life there um, and continue for so then after opportunity um working on her for a couple years i started working on mars 2020 and 2015 i think i'm talking for a long time so i don't <laughs> know it's this is great though i mean speed it up but i started working on mars 2020 back in 2015 so five years ago and what my job really became I, i'm a systems engineer so all the little components on the rover that have to fit together and talk to each other and maintain the health and safety of the, the vehicle, that way the science can be done. Um, that is what I do. So I focus on the health and safety of the vehicle as a whole. And I learn enough and I investigate and learn enough about all of the sub components of the vehicle, the subsystems to write procedures on how we can break things. So stress test the vehicle because we want to try and stress the vehicle and break it while it's on earth so we can fix it before we send it to Mars. Um, and we can't fix the hardware once we've sent the vehicle to Mars. So that's really what my job is, is to come up with ways on how to break things um, and then test them, go into the test bed like Justin was showing earlier, go into the test bed, test it in the test bed. And then as I start breaking things, you write up tickets, you have someone go off and fix them. Then you test them again and make sure they don't break. Once it passes the test bed uh, test to make sure it doesn't break anymore in the test bed, then you test it on the real Rover. And that is the coolest thing. When you're in the, the building across lab from where Justin is and you're with Perseverance in her home, in her clean room, and then you test everything again and try and break it and it doesn't break. It's just this beautiful, emotional, incredible experience um, for the design and test of the mission. The real bread and butter of all of it is going to be once it gets to Mars and lands and we do it for real on Mars and we actually send these commands to like make it do what we did in the test bed and then what we did in the clean room then when we do it on Mars for real, there's lots of cheering and high-fiving and crying um, that goes on. So anyway, I guess that's what my job is. 
And then I will end up being an operator once we get to the surface. So that'll be really exciting. And then the last thing I want to say before I hand it over back to you is- no, this, is this is great. <laughs> you, you obviously just hate what you do and have no fun whatsoever. Yeah, I hate it. I hate it. Um, <laughs> yeah, this period has been, and I don't know if we're going to talk about it today, so I just wanted to mention it, but with COVID-19 pandemic and all of us working from home, um, it has definitely brought our team together in a way that we wouldn't have otherwise. And we've had to come up with creative ways to see each other and talk to each other and communicate. Um, and so it's, it is a very unique time for our project. And for, and so if people have questions about that, I can go into that. Well, and some people are dealing with some personal uh, changes and. Uh... Yeah. So another news <laughs> on top of all that for me personally. Just, just to put this in context for those of you who aren't already amazed enough by this woman. Uh, I, think, I think, yeah. Thanks, Jason. Um, I am expecting a, another baby. I have a two and a half year old Milo, but here, I'll show you guys. I'm very pregnant. Um, so, Becca's pregnant. doing this all while she's eight months pregnant, just so everybody understands that. So, yeah, and the project's really accommodating and great about parents and moms and dads who want to have kids crazy times like right now. In fact, my baby might be born when on launch day. We'll see what happens, but uh, I'll anyway. put a whole new spin on things. <laughs> Okay, Jason, I'm sorry I talked for so long. No, you're, this is wonderful. So yeah, why don't you uh, mute your audio and video? We're gonna go to Elio next. Oh no, excuse me. Uh, actually, yeah, let's let's go to Elio next and say, I read out of order, but it's kind of a random order anyway. So uh, Elio, are you uh, able to join us? Paging Can Elio. you see me and hear me? Yes, holy cow, you're- the, All right. Are you are you I'm in Jim Bell? Are you in Jim Bell's garage right now? <laughs> no, actually, I'm next to where Justin is sitting. Justin is sitting right up there. Oh, that's that right. Yeah, that's, you see. that's actually that. This is amazing. You're right because this is so. This is that same <laughs> for people to understand. This is that same room. Well, this is a backdrop, obviously, but this uh, is a backdrop. This, this is if you are on the other side. Of, if you are basically where Justin showed us where the rover was, you are in that position looking up and Justin is in real life in those windows right now looking down. That's uh, right. So, so Justin and I are actually part of the same team. So I'm also a system testbed engineer and I've actually been spending most of my days this week in this lab. Just today I got drenched in work uh, from home, which is awesome how we've been able to adapt. And, and just like Becca just mentioned, like things have become more purposeful and we've become very conscious of how we spend our time in the project. And I will argue that some of us have even become more efficient. Uh, whatever has happened over the last few months hasn't stopped us from delivering the spacecraft, which is exciting. Um, and uh, yeah, think things are going pretty well and I'm, I'm really excited for what's to come. I'll actually be in Florida for the launch. So this is, I've, I've been at UPL. Right? I will be going to Florida. Uh, I have family there. So obviously this is all super risky and traveling right now. Uh, but I am looking forward to it. This is the first flight mission I work on. I've been at JPL for a little more than, than three years from now, uh, so far. And uh, my story is a little bit different. I, I was actually, I, I was born in Ecuador. Uh, I was born in Ecuador. I moved to the United States when I was four years old. So when I was four years old, we moved to New York City. I have some family there. We got lucky with um, the green card lottery process. So I ended up in New York City first. From New York City then, my older brother, he's 15 years older than I am. So at some point he decides to, to fall in love and get married with a Puerto Rican. So my mom and I actually ended up following him down to Puerto Rico. We lived in Puerto Rico for about eight years or so. So I grew up for the most part in Puerto Rico. Ended up moving back to New York City for high school. And from there, I, uh, I had an amazing opportunity. Things just kind of worked out with the school. I ended up landing in uh, a wonderful science teacher there that supported astronomical research, which was really my first uh, direct exposure into astronomy and space sciences and engineering. And we worked with NYU to study black holes. And as a high school student, like, what the heck? I look back at that now. And honestly, for a while, I didn't. It, it didn't click that what I was doing was studying black holes as a high school student. Uh, right. So, you know, 
thank goodness for that teacher who got that opportunity for us. Uh, my best friend and I at the time ended up actually presenting a lot of this, the, the data results, these results were coming up uh, in, in uh, counting basically the amount of particles around a black hole. Uh, we presented at one of these conferences in DC, the Astronomical Society Conference that happens, had been happening every year or so. Uh, you know, we were there as high school students presenting next to the big astronomers of our time. That didn't click for years. We didn't realize that that was, you know, that's what had happened. It was, it was almost um, like you didn't even know enough at that point to have the imposter syndrome that people get later on. Right, exactly, exactly, <laughs> which is very yeah. real, by the way, and that's that's a thing we constantly deal with. But, you know, yeah, at the time, I had no idea. Um, and, and, and anyways, uh, high school, you know, thankful for the teachers and the mentors. My mom obviously was, my mom was a teacher uh, throughout her time in Ecuador and Puerto Rico. So I had, you know, very much rigorous expectations at home with what grades I needed to bring to the table. Uh, so that led me to then get scholarships and, and all kinds of deals. And then I ended up studying um, mechanical engineering at the University of Michigan and also did uh, my master's there. So uh, while I was there, I love that place. Ann Arbor is an incredible town. Uh, I had incredible mentors and uh, professors that, you know, they kept pushing all kinds of opportunities our way. Design, designing systems, uh, systems engineering is what I did for my, my graduate degree, uh, were incredibly useful, obviously, in what I do today. And, uh, you know, more than anything, it was just the exposure to all these things that, all these opportunities that I, I would have never been able to been exposed to if I wouldn't have gone to, to university. Um, you know, that led to me working at SpaceX. I worked at Boeing. Uh, I did several different projects at Boeing. I worked at GE Aviation. I did research in school. All these things that ultimately led me to my current job, right? So uh, I was very involved, and I still am, in this organization called the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers, where there's a yearly national conference. And actually, that's that's where I met my current boss, uh, Eric Aguilar. And things just lined up where my skills, the need from the project, just meshed, and it was very natural. And obviously, Eric and I get along very well, so I ended up... Um, you know, just things just worked out, got lucky, but obviously I worked really hard for, for where I am today. And here we are three years in about to launch, who knows what's next. So I'm really excited for what's to come. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting too. You mentioned, uh, how were the skies in Ann Arbor when you were a kid? Like when you were younger, was it pretty nice? Cause I used to live in Traverse city. Man, and... I was studying while I was there. So I have no idea. I was in <laughs> the building most of the time. Uh, I did spend a summer there and uh, honestly, I really wish I would have explored more outside of Ann Arbor because I hear uh, nature in Michigan is unreal. And I, that's, that's a trip that I definitely have to take back uh, as uh, soon as everything normalizes. Well, Elliot, th thank you so much for being a part of this. And I want to point out to folks in the chat room, if you have questions, um, uh, Elliot worked with the Mars helicopter, which is going to be going uh, and uh, attached to the underside of the rover and if you have any questions specifically for that this is a good opportunity to speak to somebody who's worked directly with that because i know a lot of people are really fascinated by this is obviously something that's never been attempted before and uh um so thank you all right why don't you uh let's get you muted right now please and we're gonna go to jeff mcgivern uh jeff do we have jeff paging jeff nope so uh, Jeff here is, uh, what is this big E? This is interesting. Can we, uh, can we get, oh, can we get some video from you, Jeff? My video's on. Oh, there we go. Yep. Jeff, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't duping you. <laughs> uh, okay, got it. Perfect. So Jeff, I did not meet in a bar, um, but I met at a comic book convention. So, um, that, which is just, I, I think the... So this is, I, I wanna give a personal story, but keep it very precise. Basically, I, with, with the work I've been doing, I really wanted to meet somebody who was involved in working on the drills that bore into the surface of Mars, you know, the drilling mechanism, basically the science tool that the, one of the most important science tools that's gonna fly on Perseverance. And for years, I've been trying to find somebody who worked with this system because I had some ideas of how we could work together to incorporate uh, our, our different uh, 
projects. And then uh, this guy comes up to me at a comic book convention when I'm when I'm playing a show, I'm playing a rock show at, uh, on the floor of a comic convention. And then I had a talk later and he introduces the guy was me, the audience. If you don't know, the, the guy was me. Uh, spoiler alert. It was. <laughs> and uh, and it, and then same thing as before It's kind of like with Justin. I'm like, well, what do you do? And you're like, oh, I run the testing lab at JPL for the drill mechanism. I'm like, wait, what are you talking about? So again, I, and this is, I think, a good lesson for folks. If you meet people that do things that are what you want to be doing, make friends with them, be nice to them, and uh, you might end up working with them, which is exactly what happened with Jeff and myself. Um, so yeah, Jeff, I guess, I mean, that's a little bit of an intro, but why don't you tell folks a little bit about yeah, what you do? That is the, the Jeff Jason origin story. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a comic book thing. You got to have an origin story. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, so a little bit about my background. I grew up in Central Florida, across the river from Kennedy Space Center. So I grew up with launches. I grew up with the space program as being part of my backyard. Um, and you could you see this in person when you were a kid? I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah, we could see him from my backyard. We used to get on the on the roof and watch launches. Oh so, my god! Yeah, most of the shuttle launches in the '90s, all the expendable launch vehicles. Um, I saw a Delta II blow up from the bus stop. That was pretty gnarly. Blow up. Yeah, 1997. You can look it up. The Delta, 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 Delta after launch, um, it was one of those things. As you can watch the launch, it's like, oh, there's another launch. Uh, that's that's not usually what happens. Early Did it? What was the sound like from that? I bet that's what folks would. Could you hear? Uh, you, it was a boom. It was a boom sound. If you could. <laughs> I mean, um, how like how far how far away would you say you were from from the launches and the explosion? Five miles. So what's what's a what's an ex rocket explosion sound like from five miles away? Uh, it starts off as a regular rocket sound and it ends in a regular explosion sound. But I mean, is it shaking the windows? Is it that loud at that point when it hits you, or it's it's dissipated uh, yeah. enough? No, yeah, I mean it's 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 loud, but it's not like you know blood out of my ears. Right, right. <laughs> but the day is still working. You know. Anyway, I just I, I I'm only asking because I know everybody else would want to like, what the hell is that like? So <laughs> anyway, please continue. I'm sorry. Uh, so then I went to undergrad at Florida Tech. While I was at Florida Tech, I interned out at Kennedy Space Center. So I worked um, a lot of Delta II launches. Atlas 2AS was still launching. So I worked some Atlas launches and Pegasus launches. So I actually, as an intern in undergrad, I worked the Mars Exploration Rover launches. I sat console for Opportunity and Spirit. When you say set console, what does that mean exactly? You sit, you, you sit at a screen. Uh, being an intern, I didn't have any real responsibility. So I sat at a screen and I changed charts and I had a headset on listening to everyone talk about it but um, a, an engineer with the responsibility is monitoring whatever their function is so if I'm a propulsion engineer I'm monitoring pressures in the tank I'm monitoring fluid flow as we're venting the tank you know things like that um, and I'm reporting out how those different activities are going to the rest of the crew and to the the mission manager to uh, let them know Yay, yay, we're go for the next stage, or no, we need to pause and not go to the next stage. It's reasonably important, yeah. <laughs> well, as an intern, it was just watching the screens and listening to everyone else talk. Uh, uh, so, yeah, so tell us, so how did you end up in your current position? And you just got promoted. Uh, you've got a pretty big position there now. Pretty recently, yeah. yeah. So I'm, I'm currently the systems engineering integration and test lead for the sample caching system. So the primary mission for Mars 2020 is to uh, evaluate and collect samples in part to have those samples ready for a sample return mission, you know, to happen five or six years down the line. Um, the sample return mission isn't fully funded yet. So right now we're collecting them and we'll drop them off where that rendezvous point needs to be. So the sample caching system is the robotic arm that you saw on uh, Elio's background with a core on the end, these are stabilizers. So if you see a JPL or working Mars 2020 do this kind of thing, stabilizers, drill. So you stabilize against a rock and you drill into it and collect the core, you break the core, you return it back to the body of the rover. So old Jeff McGivern here is the body of the rover. And you drop, <laughs> the, bit, you drop the bit off. With, with bow tie. With a bow tie. I don't think we got that on the actual flight rover, which is unfortunate. So the, the bit then has a sample in it and you pull the sample tube out, you know, do some, how much, how much sample is in there. How big are the tubes, by the way? Like just to give people an idea, 
Uh, think of a, a magic marker. The tubes are about, you know, maybe a little bit longer than your typical like whiteboard marker. Okay. Exactly. And there's how, how many, do you know how many there are on there? There's 45 tubes. The plan they, is to bring back about empty, right? 30. What's that? The plan is to bring back 30, but you know, all that's in, in work. Okay. Right. Um, so so at, after I graduated undergrad, I moved to California to work at Rocketdyne. So I actually worked at Rocketdyne for about eight, eight years. And in, in between there, I worked for a camp stove company for a couple of years um, and then came back to Rocketdyne. And so about four years ago, I came to uh, JPL and I've been working Mars 2020 ever since I came to JPL doing mostly uh, sample caching system um, engineering. So just a quick uh, fun story. Um, we, we, so Jeff and I worked together at JPL in back in uh, November, I think it was, right? Right. And, uh, and Jeff helped set helped me set up some tests where we were going to record the sounds of, of the drill motors. So I, I brought in some microphones into his test lab and uh, we got evacuated that day. Yes, that's right. Yeah. And what was what was. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah I, can, I can talk a little bit. I can talk a little bit about that. That was so, a fun uh, story. <laughs> so the, the, the testing that I'm primarily a lead of is called QMDT, Qualification Model Dirty Testing. So qualification model means the hardware is flight fidelity. So it's it's as close to flight design as we can get it. Some of the parts actually started out as flight spares. We install those into a chamber. This is, and this is what relates to what Jason's talking about. We install those into a chamber and that's the dirty testing part. So we're actually drilling into rocks and we're actually collecting samples and we're doing everything that the sample caching system will be doing on Mars both to verify requirements, to develop operations, to make sure that we can just do what we think we need to do. Um, that chamber that we're in closes up and it's a, it's a thermal vacuum chamber. So it closes up, we pump out all the air in it, we, we fill it with a little bit of nitrogen. So we take it down, it's at Mars pressure, which is seven torr, and we chill everything down. So we chill it down to negative 70 degrees Celsius. And we use liquid nitrogen to do that. So we're flowing all this liquid nitrogen to the chamber to chill down the whole, the whole chamber. And you can imagine in a liquid nitrogen system, if you have a leak, you're, you're spraying liquid nitrogen out, which is really dense nitrogen. And then once it gets to air, it warms up and it fills a volume with the gaseous nitrogen. Well, if you fill enough of a volume with gaseous nitrogen where you have oxygen sensors, you could foresee tripping an oxygen sensor, setting off an alarm, and making everyone evacuate the building. So, in the rain. You know, Jason and I were doing some testing. We were doing some maintenance on that liquid nitrogen system. Um, they were actuating some valves and sprayed a gaseous nitrogen into a volume where there was some an O2 sensor, and we tripped the tripped the sensor. And we all it was raining that day actually, so we were all sitting there. Raining in Southern California. That was a, it was an interesting conglomeration of rare occurrences. Yeah. And just to give some folks some context, when he's talking about liquid, ni liquid nitrogen, if I'm not mistaken, if in the movie Terminator 2, that's what they used to like when that liquid that sprayed everywhere that froze the metal T1000 yeah. in place is so, liquid nitrogen. <laughs> Terminator, so, 2, Terminator 2 would have you think that liquid nitrogen is the coldest thing possible. <laughs> right. Yeah. Pretty much. And and ha having having been in the space industry a little a little bit and working with rocket engines, a lot of our rocket engines use liquid hydrogen. And of course, liquid hydrogen is 300 degrees colder than liquid nitrogen ever would be. So I question the logic of freezing Terminator with liquid or liquid nitrogen. If you have Terminators, you <laughs> have access to liquid hydrogen, and don't tell me you don't. So. I don't know if Cyberdyne's tied in. This. <laughs> this is why but we don't let scientists be movie reviewers. Yeah, we are ready for Terminator 2 now. <laughs> You've given us the heads up with the movie. With liquid hydrogen, we will stop T2000. And that's All right, why good, I'm today. Good, good rant. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, let me um, pause. Let me ask you to mute yourself for just a moment, and then we're going to, in a moment, we're going to have everybody open up. Did we? Rebecca, did we get through everybody or am I missing anyone? Oh, we missed you. Oh, okay. Well, I'm easy. <laughs> I'll be yeah, quick because, so, you are, oh yeah, go ahead, talk, sorry. Give me a minute. So we've talked about how you met literally everyone else on this call, but how about how we met? So I was giving a talk at Astronomy on Tap in LA uh, with Jim actually, it was the same night. 
And uh, and so we met at a strongman top in LA. So I already linked in the chat the link to their show because they've they've made a lot of great connections for everyone. Uh, yeah. But Jason, you are actually a musician professionally. How the hell are you involved in the Mars Rover? Okay, all right. I'll try and make this quick because our introductions have gone. I mean, they've been amazing, but uh, at some point we need to start answering people's questions here. Uh -huh. Um, okay, the brief story is, yes, I, I'm a professional musician. Um, I've been doing music ever since we had a career day in high school, I remember, where like uh, they basically walk you around and show you people that are doing different jobs and like there's a fireman there and if you and he talks to you about what it's like to be a fireman and maybe that's interesting to you. And then hopefully at the end of that day, you have some idea of what you want to do with your life. And um, I had, I had already been, I'd been taking piano lessons forever and uh, I loved rock and roll. And um, I remember I was at career day and I met everybody there and I, it was, it was, you know, it was like 15, 16 years old, something like that. And, uh, and nothing jumped out of me. I'm like, well, I guess I'm going to stick with music. Cause I mean, I don't know if I can have a career in it, but that seems to be what I enjoy. So I did music for a living. I, I studied music in college. I got a degree in music. I pursued music all my professional life and I'm still a musician now. Um, and I occasionally tour with, well, before quarantine, I would tour around America, I would tour overseas. Um, and I have a recording studio in Los Angeles. So uh, I guess how that connects to all this is when I was a kid, I loved space. I lived uh, in uh, upper, in uh, Northern Michigan, not Northern Peninsula, but Northern Michigan. And the sky, um, I think, uh, Be Becca mentioned this early, like one, one of our guests mentioned this, that you could see the stars. And I remember I could see the Milky Way when I was a kid and it was just incredible, you know? And it, um, I remember the first time my parents took me to, to a telescope and I could see Jupiter and it was about the size of a marble. And I was like, and you could see it through the eyepiece. It was there. It wasn't on a computer. It was real. And you're looking at it. It, was, it just blew my mind. And uh, I had a really cool teacher greg north was his name um, when i was in kindergarten and he showed us a model of the solar system and how the plants i've always been fascinated by space but i never did it professionally and then basically uh i grew up i guess <laughs> some might say and at some point i started realizing i felt like there was a piece of me that was missing i i, I love music but it was there was something else missing i really wanted to be involved in space and when I saw how many exciting and incredible things were going and how people were getting more and more excited about it, like I was talking about at the beginning, I, I basically, um, I discovered that um, there was gonna be a microphone attached to the new Mars rover and that this recording sound on Mars was something that never happened before. People have tried, but it's, uh, it's never succeeded for various technical reasons. And I really wanted to be involved in that. And so I basically, kind of I cold called NASA, I guess you could say, I mean, it was an email actually, but I, I basically wrote them an email out of the blue. Um, I reached out to a lot of people, but uh, I finally found the right person. And I said, Hey, I do, I, I do work with audio and music. You guys are going to record sound. I feel like I could help <laughs> maybe please. And they NASA responded. And um, about a month later, I, I got uh, asked to, you know, join uh, as a contractor, an independent contractor. And so um, basically starting in 2017, I've, I've, I've had uh, been very fortunate to be, um, I guess you would say a consultant for the one of the two microphones that's gonna fly on Mars, uh, on the Perseverance rover to Mars. Um, my microphone, and we can, if anybody has questions, of course I can answer them, but the, the one I'm working on is going to record primarily as the rover comes crashing through the atmosphere and lands on the surface. Oh, not crashing, but okay. Figure of speech, bad choice of words. <laughs> um, well, it's gonna come in really fast. And, uh, and so we're gonna record those sounds as the rockets are firing and the parachute deploys and uh, hopefully we touch down on the surface. And if it all goes well, maybe we'll be able to record the sounds on the surface along with another microphone that's a part of the SuperCam instrument uh, over the course of the life of the rover. But it's, um, if it works, it'll be the first time that we've heard the true unadulterated sounds from another planet. And it's an honor to be here with these incredible 
folks who have devoted their lives to this. I devoted the last few years of my life to it, but they've they've done this forever. And so I'm honored to be in their company. So there you go. That's well, what I'm, I, <laughs> I'm excited to be here. I have nothing to do with Mars. Uh, the things I study are a little bit further away than that. And uh, I think as Jim, Jim mentioned earlier, I am an astronomer. And so some of the things that I study are related, uh, but, but purely scientific, uh, less engineering. Uh, but I do believe that this whole uh, space endeavor, no matter what aspect that you're working on is truly a human endeavor. And so I really enjoyed hearing about how everyone and their own journeys of getting involved in, in being part of, of this rover in particular, but also in, in like space and in and, and our mission to, to explore the universe around us. What, so we do know, know, what's that? I was gonna bring everyone back for questions. Oh yeah, so yeah, everybody please unmute and un, like just open your channel up and we're gonna, um, yeah, let's do, do we have some good questions to start uh, bugging people with? So, Jim, I was hoping that you could start us off and just kind of give us an overview of the, the rover itself, because we have a question from Ben Gordon asking about what is the data or the information that the Perseverance rover is going to gather and then what are you hoping to find? Yeah, so uh, Perseverance is you know NASA's newest rover, uh, but it's very much on the outside, looks a lot like Curiosity, which landed in 2012. And there's a good reason for that. It's because it's something like 90% spare parts from Curiosity. This is how NASA was able to afford it. You know, the government budgets are tight. So we could afford a new rover by using a lot of spare parts. So outwardly, it looks a lot like the last rover. It's about the size of uh, a Mini Cooper, that kind of size. Uh, and so it's, it's a big vehicle and, and, uh, and loaded with cameras, something like 23 cameras on board, seven or eight scientific instruments, a whole bunch of other systems that, you know, we've heard a lot about that Elio and Justin and a lot and other people are working on engineers, again, hundreds and hundreds of people working on this to make these things happen. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it looks a lot like a pass rover on the outside, but on the inside, it's different and its mission is very different. And the big difference between per, uh, Perseverance and, and previous missions is that one of the main goals of this rover is not just to drill, but to core and, and collect the sample, those, those uh, you know, whiteboard pen size samples that, uh, that we talked about and, and stash them on the surface, put them on the surface so a future mission can come get them, one or two missions can come get them and bring them back to the earth, right? And, you know, everybody's in, in my business and probably everybody else on the line here is very optimistic about people going to Mars in 10, 20 years. Uh, and, and almost all the scientific community agrees and the engineering community, let's get some of that material first. Let's really understand what it's like, what potential hazards are from fine dust particles, what it's like to drive around in, what's its chemistry and composition. Uh, so partly we want to get samples back to, to help future people going to Mars, but also partly, you know, uh, we're going to a place called Jezero Crater. It's a big hole in the ground, uh, 30 miles wide, a uh, big crater that had a lake in it. it, has a beautiful delta like the end of the Mississippi River that the, lake, the channel flowed into this lake, very gentle environment. And on Earth, those kinds of places are great at preserving evidence of life. Uh, we don't know if we'll find, we don't maybe expect to find any macroscopic fossils, but maybe we'll find textural evidence or chemical evidence or mineral evidence that there was life on Mars. And we could maybe discover that subtle evidence with the rover and make some claim in a press conference, woohoo, we got five life. And, and honestly, the scientific community probably won't believe us. I was going to say, it'd be, a, it'd, it'd be a heck of a thing if they did find a fossil, huh? It, it, well, a fossil would be incredible. But unless, <laughs> remember, you don't find fossils in the, in the record of Earth life until only about 500 billion years ago, right? So fossils are extremely rare. We don't expect to find fossils. But whatever evidence we do find, if we find it, it's probably going to be controversial, probably going to be subtle. Probably we can't stand up to Carl Sagan's claim that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, right? So we've got to bring those samples back. We've got to bring those samples back, send them out to the 19, 20 different laboratories on the Earth that have much, much better instruments than we could ever send into space and see if we can you know, prove that to be true. So Perseverance is the first part of Mars sample return. And that's what kind of makes it historic and exciting. And just to realize 
you know, we're going to be taking pictures of these rocks and soils and sand dunes and stuff. And, you know, all of us could see those things with our own eyes in the not too distant future. That would be really cool. So Jim, Jim, you actually bring up a really cool point that I think a lot of people don't understand that aren't maybe scientists, which is why, why can't we send equipment to Mars to make these analyses there? And I think people don't understand the, that like the, like the size of the machines that are required to really take those yeah. slices of the rocks and analyze them in the proper yeah. way. Yeah. No, I mean, look, my engineering colleagues on this, on this uh, session understand this really, really well, how hard it is to send anything into space. I mean, the cameras, you, why don't you just send your cell phone? It wouldn't cost as much, right? Well, it won't <laughs> survive, it won't survive the, the, the rocket, the crazy vibrations and shocks of rocket launches. It won't survive the crazy sky crane landing or airbag bouncing and, you know, and then, and then the crazy 120 degree swings of the environment and this almost vacuum and ultraviolet radiation. And, and it's a harsh oh, environment. And, and then if you I mean, even get it there, you still need to control it. And so now exactly. you have to figure out how to control it from, from, you know, this far away. Exactly. Exactly. So it is a complex business and anything that goes into space is really fine tuned, beautifully engineered by folks like this and uh, and really optimized for the environment that it's going into. And that's partly why they cost so much and they take so, t so much time to build. Um, that uh, Thank you, Jim. That was awesome. Uh, all right, we're gonna, I'm gonna go to uh, Justin now. We got a question about communication. I think Justin would be probably a good person to answer this. Um, we have a question from Charles Burney. How long does it take to transfer data back to the earth? And maybe you could just generally speak a bit about how we communicate with our rover once it's there and the, the time delay and things like that that folks might not understand, you know, that, that you guys have to deal with all the time. Yeah, so we're used to, we're very used to having data on demand right now because we have lots of connectivity in various means, cell phones, Wi-Fi, um, et cetera. <clears throat> um, so the means that we get data back from Mars is similar, but on a different scale, different scale in distance and in power and in data rate. Um, so, you know, around, around town, if you're using your cell phone, your, your phone is talking to a tower somewhere nearby, probably in your neighborhood that has these antennas on it. And those antennas are built for the range that you'd expect to be talk, you know, for a cell phone. To talk to something that's in deep space, we use what's called the deep space network. And that's part of, part of JPL is three sites around the world. There's one in California, one in Spain, and one in Australia that have these gigantic dishes. They're big antennas. Um, so if you can imagine a, a telescope for looking at the stars, um, to be able to see stuff, to be able to look at maybe the planets, like you, you were looking at Jupiter through a telescope, the bigger the telescope, the more light you can see and the clearer the picture. Well, the bigger the antenna, the fainter a signal you can get. So in order to get a signal from a rover that's on Mars, we have to use a gigantic antenna. Um, and those are all, those are the reason that they're placed um, in those locations around the world is because they're relatively equidistant. So as the, the earth rotates, one of them, at least one of them is always in view of Mars or whatever planet or spacecraft we're trying to talk to. And then that data comes, comes through that antenna and then gets forwarded back here to JPL for analysis. Um, the, uh, and all, as well as the commands that go up to the rover. So for sending data to the rover, it goes through the same path. Um, the amount of time it takes uh, depends on the location of the planets. Um, so when the earth and um, Mars are closest, it's only a few minute light delay, which like what is what does light delay mean? Well, that's that's the amount of time it takes a signal at the speed of light to get from one place to another. Um, Mars is so far away, even at its closest point, that takes several minutes at the speed of light for a signal to get uh, there and back. So when we're actually doing our landing uh, sequence, you, you may have heard of the seven minutes of terror. Um, <laughs> when uh, we actually hit the top of the atmosphere, go through the landing process, um, that time to the actual landing is about the same amount of time it takes for the signal to get back to Earth. So by the time we actually get the signal that whether we survive the landing or not, it's already happened, um, which is kind of crazy to think about. But that also means that we could don't have direct control. So if um, we're trying, we can't like joystick the rover around. We we have to give the, the rover a lot of autonomy to be able to do things on its own because we can't, you know, say move this way and then and then watch it as it's doing it. 
Um, we have to do that and then have it make some of its own decisions to decide whether to go around a rock or, or over it or, um, or what to do next. So uh, it, it, it adds a, a whole dimension of challenge to the, the process of operating something. It's, it's way more than just operating like a remote controlled car. It's, it's a whole different thing. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. So to give people a sense of scale too, I mean, it takes nine minutes for light to get here from the sun and when Mars is at his farthest point away, it's it's what like double and again that. So it's like what twenty two minutes of light travel away. Is it's twenty one point five six four actually? To be exact. This this is why I love engineers. It's, <laughs> it's like hanging out with data every day from Star Trek. Data, <laughs> data. So this is what I'm talking. Um, so there's okay. a lot of potential for things to go poorly. So Becky, you talked a little bit about how your job is to try to break it while it's here so that it doesn't break while it's on Mars. We have a question from Oliver Zimmerman asking about uh, if you've ever had a time where you've encountered a technical gremlin that just disappeared without fixing, did not repeat for a diagnostic testing, and that you worry will rear its head at the wrong time during the actual mission. And that is a terrifying question. I apologize in advance because it's stressing me out just thinking about. <clears throat> it's it's a great question and it's a funny one. And I'm looking at everyone's smiling faces um, right here too, because yes, that has happened before. And I think most of us have had experience with running a test, seeing a really weird behavior and trying to repeat it. And for some reason we can't repeat the behavior. Um, there is even a checkbox uh, when we fill out like the problem report, if it's repeatable or not. Um, it's a big deal to try and repeat something. But I will say that we spend a ton of time trying our best to figure out what was going on and how to repeat the same error that we saw so we can fix something. Um, we have a lot, you know, this, everything when it comes down to it is built by people. So a lot of times that means us calling up the engineers that actually wrote the code to do that thing. And maybe that code was written on the rover before. Maybe that code was even written on Pathfinder. And there have been times when I've had a call, like we call them the Graybeards on lab. Uh, sorry, Jim Bell, if you're one of those. Um, but we call the, you know, the Graybeards and we say, hey, we can't repeat this error. We have this behavior. Um, your name is on this piece of code. Help us debug this. So yes, it happens. And we try our best to figure out um, how to fix those things. Same goes for when we actually get to Mars. You know, when Opportunity was uh, roved the planet for much, 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 much longer than she was ever in built for. And it was honestly an engineer's dream to work on that project. I, it was a scientist's dream too. I'd love to hear more from Jim Bell about that. But for engineers, um, things would start breaking slowly. You know, the rover was getting older a lot like our grandparents, great, great grandparents. And so as things started to break, engineers love to fix problems, to solve problems. That's, that's what our job is. So when things, if everything went right all the time, we'd have a pretty boring job. It's when the things break and we can like find out ways to fix them that really starts making our job fun. And if that interests you, if there are any kids out there listening and you like to break things and fix them and you know pull things apart and put them back together, then this industry is the right place for you to be in because um, we do it all the time. So I, I just want to say, so. Oliver Zimmerman, I went to Florida Tech with him. He confirmed, that's my buddy that I went to school with. <laughs> I just thought that was a funny connection. <laughs> that's awesome. I'm glad that we've got a lot of people watching. So Becca, real fast, you talked about how uh, previous rovers have lasted longer than anticipated. How is, long is the expected lifetime of Perseverance? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so with Spirit and Opportunity, they were solar powered um, as well as Pathfinder um, or the rover, Sojourner on Pathfinder. Well, no, Pathfinder was solar powered too. Anyway, now we have these incredible devices called RTGs, 
um, and they are nuclear devices that power our vehicles, so they're no longer solar powered. So Spirit and Opportunity, if nothing else had, they hadn't gotten stuck or if nothing else had gone wrong, then they could have lasted as long as those solar, solar panels stayed clean. Um, there are other things. The battery life is really what would have killed them in the end. With the Curiosity and Mars 2020 being powered by this radioactive nuclear device, um, they will survive as long as that radioactive device is, decays. So I think maybe Justin or Elio can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think what we've heard from the power team is that we have a good 30, 20 to 30, 40 years of solid life in the RTG. Um, so if nothing else stop prevents perseverance from continuing on, we could be operating that long. Is that right, Justin and Elio, or anyone else? I don't. I don't know the number off the top of my head, but I don't know the number can, off the top of my head. But I think yeah, it's, it's, it's the same. It's the same type of power source that's, that was used on the Voyager spacecraft that were launched in the '70s, and the uh, they're still operating. It's just because it's a because it's a decay process. Um, even if it doesn't just shut off, you get just less power over time. So you just start shutting things off. You can still operate the spacecraft to a certain point if you slowly power things off and, uh, and you know, decide what you want to keep. Yeah. Right. Oh, I imagine with, with Voyager, because it's not any mechanical systems, those take a lot more power than standard communications or, or does it take a lot of power to, for Voyager to send a transmission? Like what's, what's the relative draw on Voyager? Is it, does anybody know? <laughs> yeah, the, the, the transmitters, transmitters very, Transmitter is very weak. It was the camera was one of the biggest ones, which got shut off yeah. first. Uh, but they also had nothing to photograph after Neptune. So, uh, but except, the for, video, except for the uh, the pale blue dot, right? True, true. And, but that was the last of it. Yeah, and that was back in 1990. And so, uh, but the signal is very weak, and uh, the transmitter is not that powerful. It takes. The deep space network that Justin was talking about takes a 70 meter antenna, you know, three quarters the size of a football field to pick up that whisper of a flea out there 120 times farther from the sun than the earth is now. So pretty cool stuff. So it's great. I, yes, Becca, let's live 40, 50 years. Let's do it. Now let's awesome. do it. That means that all of all the kids listening out there have a chance to work on perseverance, too. Well, that's like exactly what and you said. And it means you're going to be a gray beard someday, too. That's what it means. <laughs> and also, I mean, who knows? Maybe one of the kids out there will be able to actually go and touch Perseverance on the surface of Mars. So oh, that's a possibility. Yeah, or Elio, they might be calling you up because your name's going to be written on some piece of code. And they're going to be like, Elio, pie crust leftovers, help me. <laughs> All right, Elio, yeah, while, we get, while we got you here now, um, I'm going to uh, throw some helicopter questions to you because oh, man, I hope I can answer them. this is something people are, I think, are very excited about. It's, it's very captivating to the imagination of, you know, flying, like, how the heck does this even work? So um, I'll give you a couple, I'm going to put a few questions together for you here. Um, Steven asks, uh, how did they test the helicopter ahead of time for the lower gravity and density of the Martian atmosphere? And then also... Uh, Jill uh, asks, Jill Heller asks, will the helicopter return to the rover? So, which maybe you can answer that one first because that's probably pretty easy and then. Yeah, so actually both of them, they're, they're fascinating. First, so first of all, the, we know we can fly under Martian conditions. How do we go about testing that? So we actually have this 25 foot chamber um, or several test chambers actually at JPL where we can pump down the atmosphere within the chamber to match the Martian conditions. And similarly, we can actually make it as cold as Mars. Mm -hmm. So we can actually test the rotors in um, under similar atmospheric conditions as we would be flying on Mars. Now, you may be asking, well, how, how do we simulate gravity on Mars? We, we can't just hit a knob and all of a sudden have Martian atmosphere. And you're right. The way we get around uh, testing something that, that makes it seem like the helicopter is under Martian gravity is you actually just use pulleys. So as this thing is rotating and spinning and generating the lift required to, you know, to, to rise within the Martian atmosphere that we've created, 
there's a pulley system actually helping it come up. That way it's under Martian gravity uh, and we can test very you know, Martian-like conditions on the surface of the earth. Now, the challenging thing at this point is, you know, we've confirmed we can fly in atmospheric conditions like Mars, but now going back to what Justin mentioned about the communications aspect of it and tying it to the second question, the helicopter itself is gonna be a completely separate system from the rover. So it's gonna be dropped off and the way it's gonna communicate with us, it'll actually be sending its signals from the helicopter to the rover and then from the rover back to earth. So just like it takes you know, several minutes of time for us to communicate with the rover, it's even a little bit more with the helicopter, which then you can imagine, you know, here on Earth, we can fly drones uh, with a remote control. Now, imagine this thing having to fly on its own, safely land, and then send that information to the rover, which then sends it back to Earth. All these things are what make, what make this entire process fascinating uh, and really exciting because, again, it's the first time we're going to be flying a helicopter outside of Earth. Um, and, you know, like... You know, in, in, in the 90s, when we tested Sojourner, it was the first time we had a rover on Mars. This could eventually lead to, instead of sending, you know, a rover to Mars, we can send a swarm of helicopters with scientific instruments to all of a sudden give us an aerial perspective of the surface of Mars and what we can characterize in doing that and, and uh, maybe even help out astronauts when they're on the surface of Mars. Uh, you know, provides a, a service like scouting uh, the surrounding areas, uh, exploring caverns or whatnot. All this kind of stuff is is what we're setting precedence for. So it's really exciting. As you can imagine, for this first one, after we drop the helicopter off, we're going to drive the rover as far away as we can uh, in case something does go awry with the helicopter. That's right. <laughs> That's right. That's right. I mean, we've do we're doing all the testing we can on the surface, right, on here on Earth. Uh, but at the end of the day, we are, you know, taking these safety precautions to mm -hmm. make sure, you know, if something does go wrong, the helicopter doesn't just crash over <laughs> into the rover. And even, I mean, even if it does, it's pretty light. The whole thing weighs something like uh, just a few pounds at most. And it's, it's, it's very light. It'll just end up just cracking, probably. The rover may get a scratch there'd a, afterwards. There'd, Let's not do it. There'd be a Let's few not discussions. Do it. Yeah, Let's just not do avoid it. it. Yeah. Let's not do it. <laughs> But yeah, it will be successful. I, I have full confidence yeah, the, in the team. The, the plans uh, that I've seen have the rover backing off like 50 to 100 meters, so half a football field to a football field. And so we're going to use the, the zoom cameras up on the mast up oh, there. Cool. Uh, we'll zoom in, right. and uh, the cameras have the mast cam Z cameras have video capability. So we'll be taking videos of the helicopter flight uh, in stereo at high resolution. And Jason, we need a soundtrack. So uh, you get your, fire up your microphones, man. We need a soundtrack to those videos. I tell you what, I, it's uh, it's too bad that the so for people that the, the uh, we the, the helicopter gets dropped on the ground and then the rover backs very far away. That's so right. unfortunately, we we can't be next to it. Um, I don't know that the sound is going to travel that far, but definitely we'll <laughs> get the video. That's right. Like the atmosphere on Mars is so thin that it's going to be really tough to get the sound. And I mean, the rotors on this thing are going, you know, something like eight times faster than a typical helicopter on Earth will be spinning. So, I mean, if we were really close to it on the surface of Mars, we'd be hearing quite the rumble from those little guys. Uh, but you're absolutely right. It's going to be really tough to actually pick up signal. But I mean, those microphones on the rover, hopefully they're, uh, they can pick up that signal or something. <laughs> I okay. think I just got. A, I think I just got a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see if we can like get it to like sort of go this way. I know that would freak all the scientists out, but I would be like, "Yes, bring it on!" <laughs> all the engineers are internally cringing, like, "Oh God!" <laughs> We're like, Jesus, no! God. Uh, so, Becca, you had a question for Jeff, right? I wanted to ask you while the helicopter is off doing its own thing at a safe, very safe, much further distance uh, from the rover, the rover is going to be drilling and doing things like that. Can you tell us a little bit more about uh, what is it drilling for? Does it have a scoop? Like, what is what does all of that look like? Oh, by the way, that question about the scoop is from a, a five year old named Jack. He wanted to know if the rover has a scoop. So there you go. Uh, no scoop on this one. Um, what 
what our drill is geared towards is um, we have three three drill bits. So one is an abrade bit. So what the abrade bit does is it clears a circle in the rock. That lets our instrumentation that's connected to the side of the turret interface with the rock, not, not touching it, but actually look at the rock and evaluate the what the rock's made of. That's the that's the braid bit's main purpose, to give to give us on the ground, our geologists and our scientists, insights into what we want what we might want to collect a sample of. So we also have a coring bit. So the coring bit, as its name says, is for coring. It's for collecting a sample. So maybe we've abraded a rock a couple times. We really have an understanding, or at least we think we have an understanding of what the rock is. We'll find another place on the rock. We'll place, we'll place the arm against the rock. And there's those stabilizers again. Place the arm against the rock. And then we'll drill into the rock deeper than an abrade would be. So we'll drill. It's about 70 millimeters is what it ends up being into the rock, filling up this coring bit, and there's a sample tube inside that coring bit. And so that's what we're filling up with the rock. And then we'll drop that back off at the, at the body of the rover. I'll talk about that in a second. The third bit type is a regolith bit. So the coring bit and regolith bits are both sample collection bits. So the coring bit collects rock cores, and the regolith bit collects regolith. So regolith is the the sand on the, that's the top layer of all of Mars. So it's not, it's not completely rocky, you can imagine. Mars is pretty windy, um, but the, since the atmosphere is less dense, it, the wind isn't as strong as on Earth. But you can imagine there is a layer of dust over the entire surface of Mars. Sometimes it can be a meter thick. Sometimes it can be quite thick, a really deep layer of regular. Um, so what we'll do is if we find a particularly uh, interesting interesting uh, bit of regolith or interesting section of regolith or we want to collect the regolith, we'll pull this regolith bit out. And it has what you might think of as uh, a scoop that as you spin that regolith bit, it's filling up that same bit, that same sample tube inside the regolith bit with regolith. And then we lift the arm straight up in the air, we shake it to fill up the, the to knock the, the regolith back in the tube. And then we do the same thing that we did to the coring bit, which is bring the bring the sample tube back to the rover body. And so that's when we interface with what's called the bit carousel. We drop the bit off. We have another, there, the, Mars 2020 actually has two robotic arms. So we have the big robotic arm, which you might see an engineer do this. And we have a little robotic arm, which you might see an engineer do this. So uh, out the front of the rover, you have the big robotic arm. And on the underside of the rover, you have the sample handling arm. So the sample handling arm is all tubes. So the sample handling arm grabs the tube initially, sticks it into the bit, and then it pulls the tube out of the bit. It takes it to what's called a volume station to see how much there is. We have a vision station, which takes pictures of the top of the sample, and we have a sealing station. So we insert it into a sealing station and actually seal the tube. So it, it's a hermetic seal. So it captures the atmosphere, the Martian atmosphere that's inside that tube, as well as whatever sample there is. And then we store the tube. So that store and then the tubes ride along on the rover until we go to drop them off. And so we have to call the caching process. Dropping them off, it means exactly what it sounds like. We are dropping the tubes onto the surface of Mars for Mars sample return to come and pick them up and store them back on the Mars uh, sent vehicle. So there. <laughs> so just to. Oh. Go ahead, Rebecca. So well, let's say, how deep down are you drilling? Because I know Insights they're drilling as well, and they're they're trying to go pretty deep. Are you guys going a similar depth into the surface? Or no, no. So so mole something. So you're talking about the mole instrument on Insight. Something something it's doing is trying to measure pressure and temperatures at pretty far down. We're the what Mars 2020 is doing. Think of 70 millimeters. Think of that magic marker again. No no deeper than that kind of length. Okay. Cool. Um, all right, so uh, Becca has to leave soon. Uh, and so we'd like to throw a question to her real quick. One more question. Um, and uh, so Becca, because you were involved in, uh, you know, like you said, trying to break this thing to make, make sure it works. Um, we had a question here, how does the atmosphere affect the rover? And, and then I'm gonna sort of add to that. Uh, how would you, how do you run tests 
for atmosphere. You know, obviously we're on Earth, so maybe you can explain folks a bit. How do you try and break the rover by putting it in a different atmosphere? How does that work? Yeah, that's an awesome question. So the Martian atmosphere is about 1% of that of the Earth atmosphere. So it's much, much thinner. Um, and there's various tests we do on Earth um, to make sure that our instrumentation works in the Martian atmosphere. One of the tests we do is called the system thermal test, and it's in a vacuum chamber. So I think, um, was it Jeff? Someone was talking earlier about the, uh, like sucking all the air out. Um, Me and yeah. Elio. Yeah. yeah. So Elio oh, yeah, was talking about the 25 foot chamber and I was talking about the 10 foot chamber. We, we pull the air out in both of them. Yeah, exactly. So that, Exactly. So it's the same. That's that's why we do that. Is one of the things is to get it down to a Mars-like atmosphere. Um, some of the things we can't really test exactly flight-like until we get to Mars. Um, but we do our best. Like the whole EDL system, the entry, descent, and landing system, Sky Crane. We tested it on on MSL. Um, and we're leveraging that test for our for our purposes for 2020. Um, there's another test we do on Earth where we try and mimic the Martian the Martian environment enough to pass our test, which Justin and I and Elio in some ways um, were Justin and I though were were involved with pretty heavily. Um, it's the electromagnetic interference test where we actually turn on all the devices on the vehicle or a lot of the devices that are going to be on at one time, like they would be on Mars, to make sure that they don't interfere with each other. Um, that's, a, that's a really important test. And anytime you use a cell phone or a computer or anything electronic, it most likely went through a similar test. Um, we have to make sure that all the devices on the rover are nice to each other when it comes to the interference they put out and and stuff. So that's another test we do on Earth. We do it in a tent to try and block out as much noise as we can. Um, and it's some sort of, it's, it's like a chamber. So there's lots of tests we do and we have to do them in different environments um, so we can make sure we mimic the Martian environment enough to pass them. So Becca, this is really interesting you pointed this out because like you could imagine as like maybe if you're uh, you know, if you're a, a, a runner on Earth and you're preparing for a race and you're, you know, working on your muscles and you're working on your skills, but you, you, it's sort of like what, you got to worry about also tripping over yourself. You know, like when people think about testing the rover, you know, they think about all these things it has to survive. But you, you bring up an interesting point is that the rover could actually cause its own problems uh, with these communication issues, stuff that like you might not think about it like, oh yeah, that would be a really terrible thing if we didn't think about that. Well, Jim, yeah, right. Jim, at the instrument at the instrumentation level, do we do anything actually in carbon dioxide? Do we do anything, any kind of testing that's more uh, in a more relevant environment? No, we va we we take them all the way to vacuum. Okay. Uh, at the instrument level and. Um, you know, we uh, and then we just learn from experience of previous instruments. So, you know, a lot of people say, why, why don't you put little wiper blades for the dust on the solar panels or on the front lenses or whatever? And it's like, yeah, you know, we could do that. But again, it's sort of a non-intuitive part of all this. Something that you don't really think about is that, you know, you can't just keep throwing stuff on on rovers. Right. You, you get a limited amount of mass, limited amount of volume, limited amount of power, limited amount of money limited amount of time, you know, these are all finite resources. And so, well, you know, Becca knows lots of people, why didn't you put wiper blades on Spirit and Opportunity so you could clear the dust? Well, it's not because smart engineers can't figure it out. It's because you got to trade it for something else, you know? Mm -hmm. And and uh, and so we just decided, let's not make that trade. We only have to live 90 days. How long could we possibly live? Right? <laughs> And uh, and then you know years and years later. Well, it's similar with with instruments here. We test them in vacuum. We try not to, you know, trash them with lots of dust and real Mars simulations. It's ironic, like this picture behind me, right? Is clean room. Everyone's in bunny suits. You guys are in bunny suits. You keep these things just sparkling clean and free of you know any contamination. And then they get to Mars and they're filthy. You know, <laughs> they're dirty and dusty and they're like wild animals released into their native habitat. 
now. Yeah. It's pretty crazy. Um, <laughs> Becca is going to have to go. Becca, is there anything you, we just want to thank you for your time. I know you got to go. Uh, is there anything you wanted to say before you split? Or are you good? Or uh, But we really well, appreciate you being here. Yeah, Jim just brought up something really interesting that I do want to uh, mention because I think a lot I've gotten this question a lot from my family and friends back home. So I think it's something that might be on someone's mind out there. But we do, like Jim was saying, where these ve the rovers in a clean room, a clean room for a really long time, and really what that room, the reason we keep it so clean, and there's all of these requirements we have to follow by NASA to keep it clean, is because we don't. Don't want to contaminate it with our human presence. Um, we're really afraid that if we if something gets on the vehicle that that is from us on as earthly beings and survives the trip to Mars and lands and someday we find out there it is. There's life. Life's on Mars. We want to make sure and we know that it's not from us. That we didn't put the life there. That it to know where the origin of the life came from. So I just wanted to, to um, let people know that that's one of the reasons why we keep these clean rooms so clean. It's really to protect the rubber from us. Mm -hmm. All right, Becca. I, you're, yeah, thanks. I think that's all I have. Um, I don't know here. if anyone has any last questions, but. Well, so we put Becca's uh, website and information in the description of the video, and we have that also in the chat for you. So if you're interested in learning more about what she does or, or or communicating with her, please feel free to check that out. Becca, thank you so much for joining us. Bye, Bye everyone. Thank you so much. This was so fun. Good to see everybody. So Jim, I wanted to ask you a question. We've talked about the drills, we've talked about the communications array, and we've talked about the helicopter, but we haven't talked too much about the camera. What is the camera doing? Yeah, so the, the cameras, uh, and there's lots and lots of cameras in this rover. There's more cameras in this rover than I've ever flown. Uh, science cameras, engineering cameras, some really cool cameras that are mounted like on the descent stage, looking down at the rover as it goes down the bridle, looking up at the parachute. I mean, just those are going to be crazy, amazing movies. We, we got to land safely, get the, get the downlink back. Uh, but the science cameras that we, um, that we lead at Arizona State, where I, where I am, uh, are up on the mast. You see them up on the, the head of the rover on, the, on the, the photo behind me. And they're, the, the system on Curiosity is called mast cam because it's mast mounted cameras. And we're using the basically the flight spare mast from Curiosity for Perseverance. So we knew that these new cameras had to fit in that same volume. But Curiosity has this odd behavior with its cameras and that's left eye is wide angle and the right eye is telephoto. So you have this kind of myopic view. Uh, it works great, it takes beautiful pictures. It's a little cumbersome to do stereo because you can only do stereo at the wide angle and you have to take a lot of pictures with the narrow angle of telephoto. So it's a little, a little tricky to do stereo. So we, the, the innovation that we added uh, to, to Perseverance is that these are zoom cameras. That's what the Z stands for, mass cam Z, mass cam zoom. So it's, it's a pair of match cameras that go from wide angle, panoramic view, that head spins around 360 plus or minus 90, all the way to telephoto, super high resolution. So we'll be able, we'd be able to tell the difference between uh, an almond and a peanut at the other end of a football field at our highest resolution zoom. So very high resolution, and, and that would be in stereo. So we're, we're going to do great science, a great geology, and geologic context, characterizing those samples that we hope to collect. We want to build a dossier on every single sample with everything we can throw at it to understand its context and, and, and justify having to bring it home. But we're also going to use the cameras to help the engineers, the folks who are going to be doing the driving, the placement of the arm, the other instruments that need a three-dimensional model of the rock to figure out where to do its placement, the, the coring and sampling a drill that needs to drill into a surface that might be at a slight angle will have great textural detail, stereo detail on that. So, so we're excited about not just doing the science with these cameras, but also helping with a lot of the operations and engineering that the rover needs to do. I want to uh, just chip in real quick to explain to folks. Um, so you'll see there's a lot of selfies taken of the Mars rover 
Uh, and people wonder how, how the heck do they do this? Because I can see a camera in the picture. So yeah. there's two cameras on the Rover. The one that you see in the selfie is Jim's camera. Uh, the one that looks basically like its head. And the other camera, maybe you want to speak very quickly about the other camera that's taking those pictures? Well, it's on the arm, right? And so it's just like, it's just like you and me taking a selfie, right? You, you, hold your can you hold the camera out here. And if you do it right, you don't see your arm, right? It's the same, we do exactly the same thing with the Rover. And Curiosity has one, it's called Molly and Perseverance has one, it's called Watson. And it's just a, it's a, it's a great camera, color camera on the arm and we'll be holding it out there doing selfies uh, and, uh, and not seeing the arm. So it looks like, oh, it's, where'd you get that picture? How did it take, you know, just <laughs> think about this, think about the same way you take a selfie, same basic principle. And, and, and for those that think engineers don't have senses of humor, uh, and along with Watson, there's another piece of equipment called Sherlock. Yes, Watson works with Sherlock, and, as you can okay, imagine. So which arm is it on? Is it on this one or is it on this one? It's on the, this it's on the big arm, yeah. the big arm in the front of the rover. This guy doesn't have any cameras. <laughs> uh, although there is a camera in there to take pictures of the sample mm -hmm. inside. It goes up to a I, camera. Right. I call that little arm the Tyrannosaurus arm because it's kind of like this little T-Rex, you know, little arm doing this. <laughs> uh, but the, the big arm is is really big and it's got a lot of weight on the end and it has that that uh, Watson camera on the end. Elio, you've got the you've got the big arm right behind you. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I'm, I'm going to take executive privilege with this next question because it's something I want to know about and I'm going to put it to Justin, but I think Jeff could maybe jump in on this one too. If you guys could tell us a bit about the rocket that's going to fly this thing. And uh, maybe even speak to if either of you have some information about why the, the launch was delayed. I can talk about rockets all day long. So it's, it's at, at your own risk if you want me to start. <laughs> uh, yeah, go. Let's, I mean, everybody likes rockets. So why don't you tell us what it's flying on? And then uh, I believe the delays were because of the rocket, but I might be wrong about that. Maybe you can speak to that a bit too. Yeah, so we're we're flying on an Atlas V rocket, which is the same. It's the same type of rocket that uh, Curiosity flew on. It's the 541 configuration, which means it has the five meter fairing, the big fairing on the top, and it has four solid boosters around it because it's a heavy payload and it's going really far. So we need the extra push to get it off of Earth. Um, we are now on the rocket uh, after some delays. Uh, there were some issues uh, at the launch site with processing the rocket, but they got all that figured out. Um, so now we're looking at, last I heard, July 30th as our liftoff date. Uh, so interesting history with the Atlas V, 541 configuration. The very first uh, NASA mission that flew on that Atlas V was Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. So the, the orbiter that we use at Mars to communicate back with Earth that communicates with the Deep Space Network was launched on this same um, Atlas V configuration. The Atlas V is also the first Atlas rocket that doesn't use a balloon as its boost stage. So Atlas rockets before this had to be pressurized with nitrogen to stand up straight. Uh, Atlas V actually uses an ISO grid, a standard structure, so you don't have to fill it with nitrogen in order to stand up. Um, the upper stage, though, is still a balloon. So you, you, you have to hit the Centaur upper stage has to be filled with nitrogen in order to stand vertically otherwise it will collapse on itself it's like very very <laughs> like a soda can feel like a soda can yeah the first stage it's engine is a russian engine actually it's a rd-180 it's a liquid oxygen kerosene uh first stage engine then upper stage is the rl-10 the liquid oxygen hydrogen engine yeah and it's really it's a you know these things all these they all trace trace their roots back to icbms Right. right, and yeah. it's really it's yeah. really uh, beating uh, swords into plowshares in a big way. Yeah. yeah, the the Atlas rocket, the original Atlas rocket, was the the rocket that we used for Mercury, the, the Mercury missions, the Gemini missions. So it was the, this this rocket has heritage in all of the early space flight. Uh, our first our first uh, extravehicular activity, our first spacewalk, was done being launched by an Atlas rocket. So. <laughs> Like Jim's saying, it has history back to ICBMs, and then that has the direct connection to all of the early spacewalks, all the early uh, human spaceflight. 
I feel like if we were actually in a bar during this event, we would spend hours and hours afterwards talking about rockets. All of us. Let's do it. Let's, let's, I was let's make say, it. I, that's probably going to happen anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I have a question for Jason because we've asked you nothing. And I just, uh, um, so we do have questions about your microphone. So okay. how soon after it lands or after it is on its mission to, to Mars, will we start to be able to hear the sounds of what's going on? That, okay, I don't know. That's a good question. Um, the people that are working on transferring the data back from Mars to Earth is, a, a, I, I haven't been involved with that at all. Um, however, I will say this, the audio that we're gonna be capturing is going to coincide with a lot of video and video data is extremely large. Um, I mean, if you imagine how long it sometimes takes one photo to come back and then you have 30 of those per second and you've got a video running for five minutes, it's going to be a lot of data. So it's going to take a while and there's a lot more important things that people need to transmit back from Mars before they start sending pretty pictures. So I can't give an exact answer, but I can say it won't be immediate. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if it takes a couple days, if not a couple weeks. Um, I, the, the answer is I don't know, but I wouldn't expect the audio to come back. Theoretically, the audio could come back pretty quick because it's compared to the video data, it's not so bad. Um, so I'm just guessing here, but I have a feeling that in the priority of things, it'll probably be the last item. So I would say it'll come with the video would be my guess. I'm just yeah, guessing. I don't, I, don't, I don't know either. Maybe one of the other guys does, but uh, I, I do know the good news, Jason, is that you know, early in the mission, early in all of these missions, uh, the, you know, Perseverance will have the focus of the deep space network and all of the orbital assets, the, the NASA orbiters, the European orbiter, you know, anything that can transmit data, that can relay data and the full, you know, power of the deep space network will be focused on Perseverance for, you know, the first several weeks. Uh, and so there will be a lot of bandwidth in a relative sense, nothing like, you know, your Netflix at home, but, you know, there will be a lot of band, <laughs> a lot of bandwidth in a relative sense for deep space mission early on. And so, and you're right. And the audio is small. Uh, so, um, so let, let's hope it comes down relatively quickly. Well, and, and, and one thing, something that Jim and I, uh, worked on early on together, um, was an idea that I put forward and he, he helped organize to get all the departments involved was the idea that we could coordinate the microphone system that I'm working on along with the other microphone system that is totally separate, that's run by a team of, in, in France, along with Jim's video camera system where we could potentially, if we can get all these things, if all these things are still working, we might be able to record stereo audio during a drive on the surface of Mars. I mean, this is very, you know, We'll see. It's but these things are not impossible with the mechanics and the equipment. That Is we it have. true that you uploaded an MP3 Easter egg of one of your performances and you're going to do a gig on the rover? Is that true? Can I can you tell answer you that, that question. If there was a speaker, if there was a speaker on that rover, yes, I would have done that. <laughs> All right, the next one. We'll do that on the next one. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> So, so you're you're recording the sounds during the the descent and and hopefully during operations, yeah. and we have this stereoscopic sound. But what is the goal of it? Is it spe specifically to capture engineering sounds? Is it a scientific goal? Is it for fun? Well, okay, it's potentially stereoscopic. Those two microphones are it's two mono microphones that are sure. not actually attached to each other at all. What's that? Why are there microphones in general? What is the point? So the, uh, it's funny, this, the microphone on Supercam, uh, so Carl Sagan, who many of us, uh, many of you know this name, Carl Sagan was like, uh, well, he's the godfather of, 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 of outreach. Rock and roll. Yeah, he's the man. Um, and he started the Planetary Society, which Jim is now the president of. Carl Sagan was the one who first suggested the idea that we could record sounds on Mars. Um, and so it kind of follows in his vision and the Planetary Society for many years uh, was spearheading this development, including uh, a, a, a rover, was uh, the uh, uh, Mars Polar Lander. Lander. 
Yeah. Lander, yeah. Which unfortunately did not land and, and space is hard. Oh, it, it landed just a little too hard. Rapidly. <laughs> so um, we, can laugh, we can laugh about it now. Yeah. yeah it's, <laughs> is, 20 years, is 20 years enough time? Like what's the, yeah. But um, so that, that microphone has been passed down to the, the French team and that's going to be on Supercam. And that actually has a scientific purpose where basically uh, there's a, a small laser and somebody can correct me if I screw this up, but there's a small laser on the rover that's going to blast big rocks. And the big laser? Big yeah. laser. Justin's point is it's a big laser. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, it's big frickin' laser. And uh, when it blasts the rock, it'll make a pop sound. And then the microphone on Supercam will listen to that pop sound. And depending on what that sounds like, that helps them, that, that helps give them information about the chemical composition of what they just exploded so if the sound is louder or if it's softer that helps scientists understand how dense that material was or possibly the chemical composition of that rock also uh, the health of the instrument health of the instrument as well power of the laser etc so it's right yeah. so the microphone uh that i'm working on is i mostly just there because it's cool <laughs> uh there's no real there are, you can make scientific arguments you, for it. You, I mean, you should, you should give yourself a little more credit. Like you, <laughs> if, you, if you measure the sounds during EDL, during uh, you know, entry, descent, landing, and you understand the timing of the, the retro rockets turning on and off, the parachute deploying, the sky crane deploying, if you understand the timing of all those elements, which are, oh, you can only really understand with sound plus something else you know we have the something else already we the sound provides us the second set of information to corroborate the something else so jeff actually makes a good point oh uh i, I and just sort of a real world analogy i will give is that uh a lot of times when you're working let's say if you're driving your car or if you're working with a lawnmower or you're working with power tools in your life in general Often the first indication that you have, if there's a problem with that, is a sound you'll hear. Um, you'll hear weird knocking in the engine, or you, you'll hear your engine, like something. So sound can actually be an interesting uh, indicator of a problem before it shows up on sensors or uh, visually. Um, but also it's just really darn cool and it'll sound off. That's your first non-sci-fi example uh, for a metaphor there. So I'm a, a little bit impressed that you have a real-world <laughs> example instead of Terminator. Um, but, you know. uh, I live in the world of Terminators. I have liquid <laughs> hydrogen. We, uh, I guess, um, are, we got a question for Elio, is that, if that's cool. Uh, back to the helicopter, because again, people really want to know about this thing. And this is from Bernie. Uh, Elio, I, and I guess if you want to speak to this, he's asking what, I don't think we answered this before, what powers the helicopter? And how long should that last? Did we answer that before? No, I didn't. That's a great point. So there is a battery on board. Um, and something we touched upon earlier is, uh, you know, it gets really cold on Mars. And, you know, what we want to make sure is that that, you know, our batteries and other electronic systems, you know, aren't affected by the weather and the local temperature. So the battery on the helicopter has to keep a heater on and has to provide flight and has to be able to be charged with the solar panel on board while still retaining enough power to keep the heaters on and off, uh, especially overnight so that the battery itself then doesn't end up freezing up. So to give you guys an idea, the flight, the planned flight is less than 90 seconds uh, each time we try and do it. So there are some pre-planned flights and I think there's more information about this online, but they're going to be relatively simple and we're going to try and do a total of five demonstrations, five different flights in the first 30 souls that were on the surface of Mars. So um, the battery itself has to then, you know, support those 90 seconds, support then the communication, all, you know, that data transfer from the helicopter over the rover and then, you know, remain, uh, with enough power so that the helicopter itself can 
keep those heaters on overnight that then will prevent the battery from freezing. So it is quite the, you know, the set of objectives to accomplish throughout a day from a, you know, something that's packaged and it's about the size of, you know, what I'm holding right now in my hand. Um, so it's, it's, it's pretty fascinating that we're going to be able to do that. Is there a camera or anything? There's no cameras. I know there's no microphones because I tried to get one on there. There's on, two cameras. On the helicopter. There will be two cameras on the helicopter and the helicopter actually does have its own, um, uh, I guess, like safety landing software. It's actually going to be using its own, you know, images that it's taking so that it doesn't accidentally just land on a rock and flip over. So uh, we it'll could... actually be making some of its own autonomous decisions to be able to land safely uh, on a flat surface. But there are cameras on board. And the cool thing about the, the electronics and the cameras on board is that they're commercially off the shelf. So a lot of the stuff on the helicopter is very similar to things that are in a Samsung phone. Um, so, you know, this is going to prove potentially that we can simplify our systems in the future and use things that we can, you know, go to the store and buy and put together and then put on the surface of Mars. Now that has a lot of implications and, it's all philosophical for now, but um, yeah, it's exciting. Well, this is, so two points actually. Uh, I'm actually in the same position where our microphone is something you can you can buy um, online. <laughs> and yeah. uh, I don't think there was any modification done to it. Um, I mean, there's certainly some that could be, but uh, yeah, exactly what you said. I mean, it's not cheap, but but it's it wasn't specifically made for this. Um, with the camera that's gonna be flying, does this mean that we might Possibly, if it's pointed in the right direction, we might get the first image of the rover on Mars from something else. Like well, this this would well this would happen, you know, uh, after some time we've already deployed, you know, and, and, and had initial communication with the rover is when the helicopter will actually be left, uh, you know, to be in, at a distance from the rover. But I'm. I, just like we're going to get images from the rover of the helicopter, we're going to be able to point the helicopter at the rover and take a picture. So that's going to be really cool. That's going to be crazy. Uh, that's something nobody's ever seen before. That's right. Yeah. So we're going to get some pretty cool images from this thing. Uh, and this is completely, you know, outside of the objectives. My, I'm crossing my fingers, right? That Who knows? This is going to be able to provide some scouting capabilities if we so desire. Very unlikely, but um we'll see what happens oh you can imagine all kinds of future uses for a drone like that mm -hmm. <clears throat> with right. either a robotic or a human uh rover right i mean That's just right. absolutely scouting and going around the corner and getting better resolution than you can get from orbit and essentially real-time reconnaissance yeah i mean there's lots of potential that's and that's why the technology demonstration is being done demonstrate the technology well, that's Jim brings up a good point about, you know, when, when people are driving the rover and they're figuring out where to put it and where to take it, they, they, need, they need to see where they're going. And you, you rely on images from satellites overhead. You rely on what you can see from the rover itself. And having a drone flying by nearby to exactly like you said, look around the corner, uh, you know, it's going to be an order of magnitude of in, uh, help to, to make these more these these drives more uh, efficient. That's right. It's it's gonna hopefully provide further efficiency to operations. So that ultimately just means we can do more science in less time, um, and that's obviously incredible news for taxpayer dollars. So uh, looking forward to it. Love those taxpayers. Keep it coming. Right. Keep paying your taxes. Actually, tomorrow, don't forget. <laughs> Pay your taxes or the thing will launch. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not. That's a good reminder. I'm glad I uh, am busy right now, so I can't go do that immediately. <laughs> hey, Rebecca, we got, what do you think, maybe another 10 minutes uh, and then we'll let everybody go or... Yeah, so I have I have kind of an overall question and I and any one of you can answer it or all of you can chime in. Uh, so where exactly on Mars is this rover going to be? And during its potentially very long lifetime, hopefully very long lifetime, how far is it going to go? How much ground is it going to cover? How much ground will the air, will the helicopter cover? Uh, so how much of Mars are we really exploring and what part of it? Yeah, I, I can take a stab at the start and you guys can fill in. But, 
you know, Mars is, uh, it's smaller than the earth. But there's a lot of area there. There's as much land on Mars as there is on all the continents of the earth. Right. And so there's a lot of places to explore. And when we try to decide where to land these rovers and landers, you know, we have these big, uh, conferences with hundreds of scientists and engineers get together and you start and you come up with 50 places and then you meet later and it gets down to 20 and then 10 and then three, you know, and, and there's lots of great places to go where, where we could learn about the history of, you know, potentially early life on Mars or habitability of Mars or the connections between earth and Mars early in their history uh, or what the future will be like for the working in that current environment. And so lots of choices. Uh, this particular rover is going to a place called Jezero Crater, which is a impact crater that used to be a lake and water in it. It's a beautiful Mississippi river-like delta that flows into it, sediments, layers, uh, looks like from orbit, very well preserved layers that we could be studying. So the idea is to drive around this delta, uh, look at the environment for habitability, look for any evidence that might point to uh, past life or, or evidence of life on Mars. Uh, and then, you know, that, and that could be five or 10 kilometers of driving around. If we're still going great, we could drive up and out of the crater into some of the oldest preserved rocks uh, on the planet. You know, the earth has very few ancient rocks, right? Earth is so dynamic and we've got volcanoes and glaciers and wind and rain, oceans and plate tectonics that recycles our entire crust relatively quickly in the in the time scale of our planet. And Mars doesn't have that kind of activity. So enormous parts of Mars, enormous fraction of the surface is ancient, three to four billion years old. Whereas it's really hard to find that ancient stuff on the earth. So, you know, we, we have a chance to drive up into some of these ancient, ancient rocks that are a lot like what the early Earth's ancient rocks were like and learn not about just about Mars, but Earth itself. So. Uh, how long will it survive? You know, how long can we drive? Uh, I'll let all these great engineers answer that question because they, they know the answer, I'm sure. So uh, I was just looking up the factoid here. Uh, curiosity over two years, over two Earth years, uh, traveled about 8.6 kilometers to give people an idea. And I'd imagine it's going to be a bit more because we're going to be traveling more efficiently with the updated autonomy on the road on, on perseverance. So I would probably bet between 10 to 15 kilometers over two earth years is very likely what will actually we'll, we'll travel around Jezero crater and, and to give people some perspective opportunity, which went from 2004 and the data point I'm looking at here, uh, all the way up to 2014 traveled 40 point something kilometers, which is the first rover to ever run a full marathon. Um, so we'll see, I mean, how, how, how long opportunity is on the surface and then perseverance, it's gonna be even longer, so. Um, so uh, Rebecca, can I share my screen? Absolutely. Just, if I just do it, it'll take it over. So I just pulled this up from um, NASA's website. So this is from the press release that where we announced what um, what landing site we were going to. So this is, this is Jezero Crater. This is an image from the, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, uh, the orbiter that flew on that initial Atlas V um, NASA flight. So we're gonna be landing right about here. Um, this is our target starting zone. What's interesting about that, this is considered the, the bottom of the crater so this is the bottom of that lake bed. The, the geology in that particular area is interesting because it's incredibly hard. It's harder than a lot of the other uh, rock surfaces that we're gonna come across. Um, and so we'll be collecting samples in that area that provide us a really good understanding of what a hard rock is on Mars and what it really means on Mars. And so, so notionally, if we land round about here inside the crater, we're gonna drive, you can see where this kind of looks like it might've been flowing water back in the day. We're gonna kind of drive this way if you can see my, my mouse. Um, and this is the crater rim. So where you might hear us talk about 
primary mission and extended mission. The primary mission for Mars 2020 lands on the bottom of the crater, drives over to the rim, and then the end of the primary mission is just past the rim. So we're going to be collecting samples this whole way. And then one of the concepts is every sample we take during this time period, we're going to take two samples. And at the, this rim, this rim the, Ed, the Jezero crater rim, we're going to drop half of those samples on the ground. That's, that's not where we ultimately want to take them, but it's in case from that point to the final pickup point, something happens with the rover, we've at least dropped a set of samples in the ground that we can pick up. So then we enter what we'd call the extended mission. The extended mission would take us from the Dredzero crater rim to this location on Mars. It's kind of, it's not on this picture, it's over here, called Midway. So Midway is where the, the Mars sample return mission is gonna meet up with the Mars 2020 mission. By the way, another first, the first time two different landers, two different rovers, two different missions have met on the surface of Mars. We're gonna drop off the rest of our samples Mars sample return is going to pick them up, load them into the Mars ascent vehicle, enter Martian orbit, come back to Earth, and crash land into Utah. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> Easy. <laughs> well, and you know, just to just to amplify that, I mean, the the key word in what what uh, Jeff just described was notional, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, there was a, there's a famous quote from uh, Dwight Eisenhower, right, in the in preparation for battle, planning is everything. In the actual battle, planning is irrelevant, yeah. right? And so when we actually get onto the surface, it will be very tactical. This okay. has been the case for all of the previous missions. There's a, there's a plan. It's great to have a plan. Mm -hmm. Probably when we get on the surface, we're gonna throw that plan away and find some other plan that okay. makes sense. Right. And just tactically be responding to what the, what the real situation is on the ground because we don't know. We have orbital data, but it's not at high enough resolution to know what it's really like. We don't know what the vehicle, how it's really going to respond. Uh, how we're making really work. Yeah. We're we're making these calls of what the rocks are made of from miles and miles and miles in the air. Yeah. So we actually have no idea what the surface is like. We actually have no clue. We learned this on MSL. We learned this on Curiosity. Yeah. The surface ended up being a lot harder and a lot rougher than we expected. And we had some of the wheel cracks, you know, that's been in the news. Yeah. Um, we could run into the same thing. We could land in the crater rim. I said, it might, I said we expect it to be the hardest. It might be the softest. It might be puffed. Yeah. It might be nothing. So it will, it'll be very, very dynamic. And it will be, yeah. we will be planning as we go through the mission. But this, right. that's the exciting part of it, right? The exciting yeah. part of it is not knowing what we're really going to find. That's I mean, space really exploration. Tomorrow. Like, that's exactly. space exploration. And and you know we'll be posting the images every day, and as soon as they come down, everybody can follow along. There'll be press conferences. There'll be blogs. You know, it's 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 really it's we really want to involve everybody. Uh, you know, you guys talked about taxpayers. Everybody's paying for this. Everybody's putting in to make this happen. This is a tiny fraction of our immense national wealth to do a really cool thing and explore the world, a world around us and. And so it's super important we bring everybody along for this ride, and and uh, and who knows what we're going to find? It's going to be exciting. I think that I, uh, this is your rover, people. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it like we said earlier, it's a, it's a truly human endeavor to try to understand the the universe around us, and and I'm really excited uh, that I get to at least talk to some of the people who are who are leading the way and trailblazing with with uh, the rovers on Mars. And, and I really appreciate you all taking the time to tell us about what you're doing. Uh, I appreciate all of the outreach that's happening and, and your willingness to share, again, the things that, that we are working towards as a team. Uh, so again, appreciate all of you being here um, and, and sharing some of the science. So I, um, again, will reiterate for everybody watching, all of their websites, ways to contact them are all in the description of the YouTube video. Uh, please follow along with some of the cool discoveries that Perseverance is going to make. Like Jim, I think said the launch is is soon, and so you can you can watch that uh, as well. And uh, you know, maybe not from Florida with Elio, but uh, there is a virtual watch for Justin. Justin's going too, right? You're going too. Oh my God, I'm a little jealous. Okay, so be careful, guys. Be careful. <laughs> a lot. 
Um, I just wanted to end, like end with uh, one thing. What is the thing that you are most excited about for this session? Elio, go first. That's a lot of pressure. <laughs> um, the most exciting thing, man. I'm. I'll just be biased here. I am pumped for the helicopter. That's going to be awesome. I can't wait to see this thing take off uh, from the surface of Mars. But just just seeing those first images when we land on the surface is that's once we get that everything. I mean, is going to be really exciting. But if that <laughs> says anything, it's just everything. The whole mission is so so exciting. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, Justin, you go. Um, <clears throat> probably launch first. That's going to be the most exciting for me, like in the near term. Um, and then landing. I'm excited to, to be a part of that. And actually, let me interject real quick. Justin is an uh, astrophotographer, meaning he, he takes pictures of space objects and, and has a lot of professional grade equipment to do this. Are you planning to try and capture the launch in a professional fashion, I should say, or are you just going to sit there and watch it and enjoy it? I'll be, I'll bring my camera. I've got, I've got my usual uh, launch um, kit of, of camera stuff and lenses and things. So um, I'll be, this will be, um, if uh, I believe it's number 55 for me. Um, so I'm excited, really excited to see, to have this be number 55. If it, if I'm able to get out there and it goes off on time, um, I'm really excited. Jeff, what, what about you? What are you excited about here? From, from a science perspective, the opportunity to bring back samples to Earth from Mars, that as Jim indicated, might have all like the tells of the history of the universe, right? The, we'll, have, we'll, we'll be the first time we look at a rock from Mars will be the first time we've spent multiple missions to do something like this, going to another planet and bringing it back to Mars, bring it back to Earth. I, I'm excited about that. I'm excited about seeing those samples in the hands of a geologist in a lab, cracking open the sample for the first time. Like that's that's like from the science perspective, that's incredible. I mean. <laughs> Really, is science fiction becomes reality at this point. It really is. Term Terminators or not, we will <laughs> open up those samples. Liquid nitrogen uh, or hydrogen? Who's keeping count? Uh, from, yeah. from, oh. a, from a personal from a personal perspective, working on this project for the past several years with with team members like you see on this panel, and and spending so much time and so much effort during times of national and societal strife along with coronavirus still seeing the lab stand up preach about diversity preach about the necessity of staying safe and l leveraging what the employees what the engineers believe and need i am so proud i am so proud to be part of jpl and part of mars 2020 Man, you got me all, you got me a little choked up now. <laughs> that was pretty, uh, Did you want to follow that or? <laughs> no, I don't. Jim, go ahead. <laughs> I like rocks. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, look. I part, I, I, I share Jeff's uh, passion for seeing those samples. I think you know, for me, it's going to be the day-to-day -day tactical rush of seeing pictures for the first time, sharing them with everybody in the public, teachers, kids, you know, anybody who's interested and in sharing the adventure. It's an adventure, right? And we, so many of us wish we could go ourselves and do this and we can. And so we project ourselves through these amazing robotic avatars and we, and we, we endow them with the characteristics that, you know, we would have if we were geologists out in the field and we, we anthropomorphize them, even though they don't like it. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and we, it's just an adventure. That's what I'm looking at. It's going to be day to day, turn the corner, see something new and, uh, and sharing that with everybody. That's what I'm really looking forward to. I guess, uh, I'll go last here. Um, I, the second most exciting thing I'm looking forward to is, is hearing these sounds. Um, and I, it's not really actually going to even sound that 
great. Uh, according, you know, what we predict, it'll sound a little muffled, a little crappy. Um, but the fact that we'll be hearing it, the fact that what we're hearing is from another world is, and, and this, is a, this is a first for humanity and it's incredible. Um, but the thing I'm most excited about is honestly, just this moment, just being um, able to be a small part of this panel with these people and, and be a, a small part of this mission with uh, I, I mean, this was literally a, a dream of mine that I thought would never be a reality. And, and here, here it is. And I'm so honored to be here with all you guys. And, uh, and we love that, you, man. We love uh, you, man. <laughs> and um, real quick, I just want to thank Rebecca too, because um, she's been behind the scenes making it look like this has been very smooth and easy to put together and it's been anything but, and she's amazing and uh, a brilliant astrophysicist and gives many talks of her own, which of course is not the point of this conversation, but please follow her on all of her social media. And, and uh, she has many incredible things to say. She's looking into the origins of the universe, the oldest galaxies observable by humans. And, and the work she does is groundbreaking and amazing. So, and thank you guys all for being a part of this. I'm just happy that I could be the pet astronomer here. Uh, because I, I think, you know, it's hard to, to study things that exist 13 billion years ago that we could never go touch. And the fact that this is part of space that we could go touch and we are going to do is incredibly exciting to me and, and, and inspiring. And I know that uh, it inspires a whole new uh, generation of people and, and maybe people who didn't start off in, uh, in science to, to change, uh, to get involved later on. Uh, and all of those kinds of things. So I really appreciate that you are willing to share your stories and, and some of the exciting things that you're doing. Um, I'm just gonna end a little bit here with a plug <laughs> for our Astronomy on Tap show. So Astronomy on Tap is a worldwide event. Uh, it happens in over 30 cities every month. And especially now while everything is virtual, you can watch any of them. So check out astronomyontap.org if you're interested in looking at some of the online videos. You can also see uh, from our channel that we're streaming from right now, all of the shows that we subscribe to will show you all the other Astronomy on Taps that are currently going virtual. In fact, Tucson's uh, Astronomy on Tap called Space Drafts is doing their first online show tomorrow night. Uh, so we'll have that link for you in the chat as well. Our Astronomy on Tap, our normal show, is going to be at our regularly scheduled time of the third Tuesday of the month, which is next Tuesday. And so we've got some people talking about exoplanets. So not just the planets that we can study in our own solar system like Mars, but what about planets around other stars? And what are those like? And how can we understand their compositions and study them? And so please uh, check out all of our, our websites. Please follow these speakers. They've do, done, done an amazing job explaining uh, their science and the things that they're working on. And, uh, and subscribe to our channel if you wanna watch more of these kinds of shows. So thank you everyone. I really appreciate you all being here. It's yeah. been truly, truly an honor and I cannot wait for launch. I am cheering you on. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Jason. Thank Thanks you. everybody thank for Thank you guys for the invitation. In. Yeah. And thanks to my sister Sarah for giving me this rover bow tie. Thank you. I so love much. your tie so much. <laughs> Wait, there's rovers on that thing? <laughs> Show it off. That's awesome. Oh wow, nice. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> All right. So I guess and Rebecca, you just you'll you'll call it, right? We're good? Yeah. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you all. Yeah. Thanks for everybody for tuning in. Gracias to everybody. Talk to you guys later. Elio, you're awesome, man.